Crawford, Illinois, 1972. And about all that group that I had that when, that when we were up there pastoring, the ball, nearly all of them are dead and gone now. Her name is Betty Parks. And uh, she wanted us to come up there. And Barbara said, do you know how far that is? <laughs> Used to, it's about like driving from here to Wickland. But I'm telling you what, from here to Duke, looks like a thousand miles to me anymore. The older you get, the longer the distance gets. Uh, but Betty is doing well, and her husband, I'll just say this and then we'll teach you. Her husband, uh, she was in church, her husband, I never could reach him for the Lord. Uh, they were quite well off, and Jack owned two car lots there in Rockford, but he was a professional gambler. And he used to take me to the card games. He said, you a preacher and went to card games? Yes, I did. Uh, I've been to Chicago with him, I've been to Rockford, Illinois with him, been up in uh, Wisconsin with him, and I've seen as much as a half a million dollars in cash laying on the table at a card game. And Jack would always, the reason I went with him, he would, he always would tell them all before we played, Glenn's going to preach. And honest, and so I got to preach in card games. Uh, I'd get Jack to come to church, and I looked up one night, and there was two rows of all these card players from all up in that part of the country. And I said, glory to God, I finally got a shot at them. And had one out of the bunch to get saved. And I got to baptize him. And his wife got saved and come to church. But uh, a long story short, I went by one day. I used to go by with Carlock every week and talk with Jack. And I went in one day and he was sitting there with a deck of cards in his hand. And I brought him a cup of coffee and we sat down and Jack, uh, he started to cry. And he said, Glenn, I wish I had what you had. I said, Jack, it's just as plain and simple. You can have everything I got. He said, no, I can't. He said, these cards own my soul. I said, how do you figure that? He said, I came to Rockford when I was 16 years old. Went to work at... Uh, the shop down there uh, where they made parts for the screw machines. And he said, I, first indication I ever had, me an ignorant old country boy from Arkansas, they got me playing the check pool. You numbers of your check equals out to the best card hand. And he said, I started that. And then at lunchtime, some of the men was playing cards and they got me to play. And said, I know this cheap, but said they had take my paycheck every week. And said, I made up my mind I would be the best and beat the best. And he did. He was some kind of card player. And I preached Jack funeral in one of the hardest things I ever did in my life. I felt like a complete failure because I never could reach him uh, for the Lord. When we were on the road, when we were up in that part of the country, we'd always go by Jack's and Betty's and we'd always spend the night with him. As good a man as you'd ever want to see, but his goodness could not save him. And the things he picked up as a young man got where it owned him. And so I want to say to you and you say to everybody you meet, no matter what habits you have and no matter what that you've done and are doing in your life, God will save you. And if you fall down, God will pick you back up. I'm a prime example of that. I've done more stumbling and falling around than anybody, and God's never quit loving me. All right, so much for that. Uh, let me recap for just a minute. In the third chapter, it talks about the wives, how that they're to kind of keep their mouth shut with their husbands if their husbands is unsaved. And be meek in spirit, have a kind spirit about them. And he's, the, Paul said, or Peter said, if you do this, you have that opportunity through your testimony and the meekness and loveliness of your heart to win that person to the Lord. Then he comes down to the men and he tells the, the men the same type of thing, but he's talking about uh, how they are to treat their wives. 
uh, how they are to love their wives. And then he comes down, this is in the seventh verse, and he says, likewise, you husbands. And then he comes on down and he starts talking about the church, how there should uh, we shouldn't uh, yield evil for evil. But if somebody trespasses or hurts us, we need to have forgiveness in our hearts. We need to have love in our hearts. Don't retaliate. If somebody does something to you, don't retaliate and do something back to them. That's a hard thing. My nature is, if you get me, I'm going to get you. That's my nature. How about yours? Yeah. I might, now, women are worse. <laughs> they might not do it then, but it's a coming. They don't forget. Nope. Now, I'm, you know, I can't remember when tomorrow gets here, I forgot what I did today. Women don't do that. Sometimes it might take 20 years, but it's a coming. So it ought not so to be. So yield it to Christ, and he will make the difference. Now, saying all that, we're down to the 18th verse. For Christ also... These little words, just look at them, they mean so much. For Christ also, we're not in this battle alone, we're not having the problems alone, also hath once suffered for sins. I didn't think Jesus did any sin. He didn't. He never sinned. He never, he never trespassed. He never retaliated when somebody did him evil or wrong or hurt him or said things that weren't true about him. He didn't. He never committed a sin. But said he died. And underline the word once in your Bible. That means one time. Uh, for Christ also suffered once for sins. The just for the unjust. Jesus was just. We are the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, notice, they crucified his body, and his body died. No doubt about it. But there was an eternal part of him, and we have that same eternal part that he had. The soul. The soul is eternal whether you go to heaven or hell, whether you're saved or lost. That's a part of you that's never going to die. Every person that has ever lived, every person that lives now or ever will live, the body will be gone one day, this flesh. But the soul of man is eternal. So that's what Christ died for. Christ didn't die for Glenn Crow's flesh. You can look at it every day and it deteriorates and deteriorates and deteriorates. But the soul of man, there's no deterioration to it. Whether you're saved or lost, it is eternal and it is there forever and it will always be. Throughout all eternity, that soul, the reason that is eternal is because it is, came from the eternal God. When he made Adam, he breathed into the nostrils a breath of life, and he became a living soul. And so the soul was given by God. That was part of God. That's what makes it eternal. And what makes the flesh something that deteriorates because it was made from a substance that God had already made, and it was made from the dust of the earth. So Christ died once. The just for the unjust didn't die for our flesh, but he died for our soul that it might be eternal. So he was put to death in the flesh. His flesh died. But it said he was quickened by his spirit. Now, the word quicken is really important. When Jesus died and they buried and they planted his body in the ground, the flesh was dead, but the spirit, the soul of Jesus was not dead. Now, how did Jesus resurrect from the dead? When it uses the word quick,
quickened, it means that it can be made alive again. So his body was resurrected not by the, the flesh, but it was resurrected spiritually, spiritually. So you and I have that same promise. If we're saved and we die, and the Lord Jesus would come back after we're dead, our bodies are going to get raised, and our soul is going to be united with that body, and that body is going to be changed into a new glorified body like that of Jesus. Betty today, when she talked with Barbara, uh, she said, uh, Barbara said, boy, these are the last days. Betty said, yes, but the Antichrist has got to come first before Jesus comes back. I asked Barbara, I said, what did you say to her? She said, nothing. I said, Barbara, I know that I never preached that. And I know that I never taught that. I said, where did she get it? She said, in 40-some years, as many places he has gone since you've been there, no telling what she's heard. But I'm here to tell you, the Antichrist will not come before the rapture of the church. Right. We are going to be gone, and when we get on over into grace, we'll teach and show that. 19th verse by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. All right. We may just, this is maybe as far as we get tonight. This is the thing that I always wondered about. We get saved by grace. But what happened to all those people that died lived and died before Jesus ever died on the cross. What happened to those poor people? They didn't have a chance to be saved. They didn't have a chance to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Old Testament does it ever tell them that they can be saved. Nowhere in the Old Testament does it ever say to them that look forward to heaven. It never says that. The only thing that it does say, that they look for the Messiah, for the Redeemer, for the one that was coming. So it says when Jesus died, he went to preach to those spirits that were in prison. Now let me give you, we won't go to all these places in the Bible, but I'm just going to sum them together and put this to you. You know the book of Jonah? The New Testament said, even as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three, for three days and three nights, even so must the Son of Man, that's Jesus, must be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now what would be the purpose of Jesus going into the heart of the earth? Now his body was buried in a tomb. It was sealed with a stone. So why, while his body was there, why would his spirit, his soul, want to go and preach to those that was in the heart of the earth? Can somebody tell me the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Mm -hmm. yeah. Rich man died. 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 Lazarus died. died. All right. The rich man, when he died, what happened to his soul? Went to, torment. Went to hell. Went to hell. When Lazarus died, what happened to his soul? It was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. Then it says that the rich man saw Lazarus. So that tells me that they were in the same place. Both died. Rich man went to hell. And Lazarus went to Father Abraham's bosom. But there was a problem. It said that there was a great gulf fixed between where Lazarus was and where the rich man was. And that one that was in hell could not pass into Father Abraham's bosom. Neither that was in Father Abraham's bosom could 
could pass because there was a great gulf fixed. So where was hell? Hell was in the heart of the earth. Now, Father Abraham's bosom, what was it called? Paradise. We're back over in the writings, it starts with a P. Paradise. It was called paradise. Now, before Jesus died on the cross, before he resurrected, up until that time, all the Old Testament saints and all, when they died, they went in the heart of the earth where Father Abraham was. He was the promised seed to be the father of a great nation. And Lazarus was there with him. And the rich man was in hell of every person that did not live by go the direction of God. There was a great bill fixed. Now he went and preached to the spirits in prison. What kind of message did he give? They never seen Jesus like the people that lived when Jesus was preaching and doing miracles. They had never seen him. They had only believed that the Messiah was coming. Now when he is void from his body, he goes, his body goes into the grave, his spirit, his soul goes into the heart of the earth, and it goes into the compartment paradise. Hell is there, great gulf is there, and here are the saints of God. Now these have never been saved. They know nothing about going to heaven. The only thing they have ever known is that Messiah is coming. Now here comes Jesus, and he preaches to them, I am the Son of God, the one that you have looked for. I am He. I am that I am. They believed. Now, it says that hell hath enlarged herself. Now, if you've got hell, and you've got paradise, and you've got a great gulf fixed, how could hell enlarge herself? Enlarge means to get bigger. How could it get bigger? It says that when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he, left kept, he led captivity captive. All the Old Testament saints that were in Abraham's bosom in paradise, he took them and he removed them and they went to heaven. Amen. Now you and I are standing on the other side and we're looking to heaven. Those people didn't look to heaven. They looked for Messiah. Messiah went and preached to him, and they embraced that, and they left. It says in another place that after Jesus resurrected, there were many that had died that resurrected and appeared unto the living in Jerusalem. And I'm getting excited now. <laughs> this is good stuff. Amen. Now, how did you know that paradise was in the heart of the earth? And how did you know that paradise is in heaven? Well, who was it that said, I knew a man once, whether in the body or whether in the spirit, I know not. But said he was caught up into the third heaven and he called it paradise. Now, if paradise was in the heart of the earth, and if paradise was where Lazarus was, Paul said that he was caught up into paradise. So that tells me that Jesus went and preached to the spirits that had lived before he came and died on the cross. He preached to them and he removed paradise and that's how hell enlarged herself. The great gulf was removed because there was no need of separation because there were no believers left. Right. That. Right. So that's the reason. That it, man, when I saw that, I said, glory to God. Now I know that David, Solomon, the old te Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, all these Old Testament saints, man, they're gone. They're in the 
presence of God. Now, we, we don't know anything about that because we didn't live there. We've lived on the other side of the cross. So when we die, we're going to paradise. We're going to the presence of the Lord in heaven. So I'm excited about that. That straightened out a lot of questions that I had in my mind. Why did Jesus, why must he spend three days and three nights, it didn't say in the grave, but said the heart of the earth. Sometimes I think we can get a look at hell when earth's mouth opens up and spews molten lava out. What do you think? Sounds good to me. That's good preaching anyway. Amen. <laughs> I've never been down there, and I'm not going down there. I just know it's hot. If it wasn't in, it couldn't come out. Okay. 20th verse. Which sometimes were disobedient. Now, it's talking about those. Those that had died before Jesus came and died on the cross, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long, the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Now we're going to change subjects now. We're going to see that Jesus that uh, Peter is going to try to teach us something before Christ and something after Christ. In the days of Noah, how long did he preach when he was building the ark? And how long did it take to build the ark? 120 years. Now, that's a lot of preaching, and that's a lot of years. And he didn't do much good, did he? No. He had him eight souls saved, and it was his family, the only ones that believed. Rest of them was disobedient. But yet it says, in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, were in few that is eight souls that were saved. Now, what does that mean? 21st verse. The like figure. The like figure. So he's what we've just read prior to this is an example, a sample of what he's going to show us. For this is a like figure wherein to even baptism doeth also now save us. Now let's stop right there. And I hate to call names, but I'm going to call it anyway. I have a lot of friends that are church Christ. They believe in order to be saved, you've got to be baptized. That's what saves you. And I've had them to use this verse in me conversing with them. It says that you are to be baptized because that's what saves us. Well, if you just stop reading right there, that's what it says. Now that's why we have different denominations and different doctrines and different teachings. Because if we would just reach down and take a verse here and a verse here and a half a verse here, you can prove anything that you want to believe. And you can justify it. But what makes it important is that this is the entire Word of God. From Genesis through Revelation, God gives us the whole picture, not half of it. And he doesn't withhold anything from us, but he gives it to us that we might be able to see his program. Now notice he said, uh, the like figure wherein to even baptism doeth also now save us. Now, then he says, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the flood came and water covered this earth. But yet Noah was saved in an ark. All the people that lived that didn't receive 
received the message, they were destroyed. Flesh-wise, they were destroyed. Soul-wise, they went to hell. Noah and his family, those eight people, when they died, they went to paradise. Now, Noah and his wife and his children and his, his family, those eight people, they're in heaven. They're in paradise. Because Christ went and preached to them. So he said, this is an example. This is a like figure. We're into it even baptized now saves. Now it brings up the point, why do we baptize today? We baptize for this one reason. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. A good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what does baptism and how does it show everybody what we are? We know that Jesus died. We know that he was buried. And we know that he resurrected. So baptism is an outward testimony of what you have done inward. The water does not save you. The water did not save Noah and the eight people the seven that was along with him and him, the eight people. It was the ark. The water is what did the destroying and it represents death. So when we baptize, we're saying to the world, look at me. I have died with Christ and I believe he died with me. When you die, you get buried. You're put under the water. Jesus died and he was buried. But the third day he resurrected. You're saying, I died, I've been buried, but I have been resurrected with Christ. My sins are forgiven. Your body is not saved. Your body will never be saved. It is your soul that's saved. It is your soul that Jesus died for. It was through his spirit, his soul, that he went and preached to those in prison. It was the soul, the spirit of those that when he removed paradise, they went to heaven. They went to paradise with him. So that makes me feel better about baptism now. It's, it doesn't make you get saved. But when you get saved, you aren't ashamed that you are saved. And you're willing to show an example to the world. Look at me. I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. I embrace it. I accept it. And I'm not ashamed of it. Amen. Water don't wash away your sins. Water don't get you into heaven. But it is an answer to a good conscience. What he says. An answer to a good conscience. 22nd verse. Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Now if you want to know where Jesus is. Spiritually, soul wise, he is in heaven on a throne seated by the right hand of God. His sole purpose is that everybody that wants to come to God that's unsaved, they come through Him. His Father, which He's on the right hand of, He pleads our case through His blood to the Father and the Father forgives us because of Jesus of what He did. He is our sacrifice. He is our salvation. He is the only means that we get to heaven through Him. Now notice what He has. He's seated by the right hand of God. He says, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. Everything in heaven, everything is under His authority except God. He's the Father. But what God's will is the will of 
of Jesus and what the will of Jesus is God's will because they're one. They love in unity. So that gives me so that gives me excitement. Now I understand how all the Old Testament saints got right. Now I understand how all the Old Testament saints got put into the presence of God in heaven. Now I understand how hell hath enlarged herself. Now I understand the role of Jesus. Now I understand about baptism. And all these things is for a good conscience. My conscience is clear about, I don't have to wonder, am I saved? I know I'm saved. I don't have to wonder, am I ashamed of the Lord? No. I stood before everybody in a pond out by Charles Borden in November and got baptized with a skim of ice on it. <laughs> Boy, you've got to be saved to do something like that. I remember our pastor didn't want to do it. He wanted to put her off till spring. I said, no, I want to be baptized. And it took my breath. I will always remember I was just like a young rooster trying to crow for the first time when he brought me out of that water. I was, I was hunting some air. But that, my, that soothed my conscience. That let me have assurance that God lived in my life. And everybody that was there knew that I had given an open testimony. Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and I'm saved. All right. That's good enough for tonight. That's a lot to absorb. You say, well, it didn't take you long. No, I just talked fast. <laughs> and I pray that, that you go home and study these things. Run them through your Bible. That's the reason you got references in your Bible. Now, the reason I don't take you to a whole lot of scriptures is because it's a challenge. If I tell you everything, you will not spend any time looking for yourselves. So if I introduce you to all these things, and I can whip your appetite spiritually, and you begin to go and read, these things will become part of your life. And the more you read and the more you absorb, the stronger you get, the more spiritual you become, and that's what you call growing in grace. Would you agree with that? Amen. I want to grow in grace. I want to grow in grace. I used to go to Bible conferences. I used to read everybody else's books. And I, I would think, man, this, this is what I know. But then there came a day that I, got, I said to myself, what do you believe? I found out that I believe what everybody else said. So I had to get in the book and find out what I believed. And my beliefs had to become what I could prove. And if I couldn't prove what I believed, then my belief had no foundation. And do you know what? Most of the things that I believed wasn't found in the Bible. And that's why that I promised you and I promised God. That when you come, I'm going to do everything that I can to feed you and to keep you safe. And I can stand up here every service and tear the bark off of it. Just whip you. And take the Bible scriptures and whip you. But you would never grow. You would be stunted and you would get discouraged and you would quit and you would fall by the wayside. So a pastor, a teacher is somebody to give instruction, not what he believes but what God says to believe. And that's where you grow to come from. Amen? Amen. Oh, I'm so glad you came tonight. You say, well, the house is not full. Well, we've got a lot of sick, but it wouldn't make any difference. If one of you showed up, I'd give you the whole load anyway. <laughs> I don't preach to numbers. I preach to numbers in my life. The largest group I ever preached to was 20,000. That's an experience. Couldn't see everybody. Uh, about three, four, maybe five, the smallest group I ever preached to. That's all right. That's all right. Jesus taught by the ones and the twos. When he had something real important to say, he just took him one or two off and he talked to them. Sometimes crowds can be advantageous. Sometimes they can be constricted and, and, and hold things back. I'm for, I'm for this, that the house be full. But if the house is not full, that don't bother me. I'll give it to you anyway. 
Let's stand together.